I want to come to the other concept that you've laid out in your paper, and it's not the first time you guys have talked about it, um, which is the concept of swing states. Yeah, yeah, right. And going back to the global sort of competition aspect uh, of AI that we were uh, talking about, um, I wanted to ask you to elaborate on that. Geopolitically, of course, swing states make sense, but in the context of AI. Uh, you know, first layout for us of the states that you think are swing states in the context of this AI competition, and why you think they are swing states and not just, you know, relevant players. Could they swing away from, let's say, a US uh, and friends group? Uh, is that a real possibility? And if so, in what scenario do you think that could happen uh, in the case of certain countries? So let me first try to just for for your listeners um, encapsulate the notion of, geo, of geopolitical swing states before I get to AI swing states. So this is something that my partner Jared Cohen, um, you know, a way of thinking that that he's articulated well. It basically, we'll try to make this quick. Is um, we in the early '90s we lived in a largely unipolar world of you know very broad and acknowledged U.S leadership um, you know, on the world stage as you know the predominant great power. We then emerged into a world of more multipolarity, the rise of China, its geopolitical ex- significance, its economic throw weight. Um, and what we, we've observed is that both of those parties, while obviously hugely consequential and important, both have been somewhat reluctant or unable to express the kind of clear global leadership that has characterized prior prior periods. And what that has permitted is the rise of what we call geopolitical swing states, which are countries that in prior um, you know, stru- constructs would have aligned uh, very deliberately and consistently with one pole or the other. You know, they are a US you know, affiliate, they're a China or Russia affiliate, et cetera. And, they tend to look at the world and vote through those that prism. Increasingly, as there's a little bit of vacuum of leadership on the global stage, important nations um, have the agency to express their alignment on a kind of case by case um, basis. Issue and by issue basis, yeah. Can be kind of single issue voters to to uh, use a political political term and they can align with China on certain things, they can align with the US on other things, they can align with the EU on other matters. Um, and that gives them a certain, again, agency, flexibility and power in the world. India is sort of the paradigmatic, paradigmatic example of that. Obviously a rich history of non-alignment um, that's characterized you know, Indian geopolitics. Now I would call it almost more multi-aligned, which is a, such an important constituent in global leadership so much emergent power and able to align with, you know, uniquely with various poles of leadership, depending on its own interests and what it believes is best for the world. And so that agency and flexibility. So we've talked about that at a geopolitical level. Now we've also tried to use that in an AI level to say, which is okay, kind of same thing. You've got, you know, two leaders emerging in this, um, in this world of generative AI in US and China. The countries that we went through earlier that have meaningful power and contributions to make, will they tend to align with one or the other or both in terms of the way these these models and this this industry evolves? And so, uh, you know, it, it's early. To, again, it's way too early to determine. Um, uh, and, and you can see but you can see a certain polarity in the way that regulatory approaches are, are playing out country to country. So. You know, it's less of a conclusion about the way countries are behaving now, but a a way of applying a mental model we've used in geopolitics to way things may play out in technology, you know, geotechnical, technological terms. Yeah, and I I found that very interesting. Uh, I'll tell you why. One of the things that you mentioned, right, is innovation blocks, right, in your your, uh, piece. You know, if you look at the geopolitical trends you were describing at the world level where Maybe there's a multipolar, uh, uh, you know, you said there's maybe a vacuum of leadership, uh, global leadership, and hence different countries are finding agency and finding different themes on which they might align differently. One of the ways in which that geopolitical piece or trend is playing out is that countries are forming regional 
groupings, right? And not so much relying on very large UN style uh, or the traditional Bretton Woods institution style global groupings, but saying we'll form regional groupings which allow us to further our interests, further our uh, collaboration, etc. You know, you have many such examples now in the world, the Quad, Occurs, you can name many, right? And as I was reading your piece, and the moment I read innovation blocks in the concept in the context of swing states, my mind went to those regional groupings, right? And the trend of regional groupings emerge. Is your idea around innovation blocks similar that you find that maybe let's say on open source LLMs, it could be countries that are more aligned towards the open source innovation ecosystem start to work a lot more together versus others that are not closed and then maybe countries that are uh, you know that have a leg in both open source and closed source LLMs might be in both or might not be in either like what's your concept of innovation blocks and how do you see that playing out um, it's a, such a great observation and uh, you know as you observed uh, the Indo-Pacific is you know a nexus of newly formed alliances and groupings and and so forth and it's going to be super interesting locality for that yeah, I think there's a one interesting argument uh, that's been in the news recently for the fact that there will be groupings of like-minded nations and regions that cooperate in this is the just extraordinary Perfect. capital costs associated with proliferating and getting to scale these these algorithms. And so, you know, uh, Sam Altman reputed to have floated the uh, estimate of requiring some five to seven trillion dollars of capital to Plus, bring, bring the full Abdullah. possibility of this to life, which is, uh, you know, it's literally a startling, a startling number and a substantial share of, of global GDP if it came to pass. The capital intensity of this model and by the, the energy intensity of these models may um, it, it may benefit yes. people who um, cooperate to tackle these these challenges in cooperation and mutually fund the development of regional models or national models, et cetera, and sort of defuse, uh, diffuse those capital costs across a set of, of competitors. That might be an interesting impetus for, for that shift.